Welcome to the first half of this copywriting session. In this session, we're laying the groundwork for an overall understanding of some of the technical aspects of copywriting. Things that make a headline a headline, a subheading different from a headline, and other important copywriting elements. So okay, let's get started. In this session, you'll develop an understanding about the constituent parts of copy. You'll also explore the function and performance of each copywriting element and how they relate to one another. You'll also explore how the various copywriting elements link together to create the smooth and effective flow of copy. Here we see the 10 elements for a print advertisement. First we have the headline, which exists to get your attention and draw you to the subheadline. With the subheadline, this exists to give more information and to further explain an intention getting headline. Next up, we have a photo or a drawing. These exist to get your attention and to illustrate the product or the service more fully. The fourth is a caption. Captions always accompany a photo or a drawing, and they exist to describe that photo or drawing. It's an important element and one that is usually more than often than not read. Next, we have the copy itself. And again, this exists to convey the main selling message for your product or your service. Next up, we have paragraph headings, and we use these to break up the copy into chunks, thereby making the copy look less imposing. Logos. As you can imagine, logos exist to display the name of the company selling the product or the service. Another element is price. We usually include price in a copy just to let the reader know what the product or service costs. The price can be in large type or it can be buried in the copy itself. Next to last, we have the response device. And we provide this to give the reader a way to respond to it of an advertisement. This could be in the form of using a coupon or providing a toll-free number or an email address or ordering information and this typically appears near the end of an advertisement. Last we have out of to provide the overall appearance for an ad by using effective graphic design for all the other elements. That's what we mean by an overall layout. As the legendary ad man Joe Sugarman says, the function of these 10 elements is to do one thing and one thing only, and that's to get the reader to read the very first sentence. To this, I'll add two more reasons why we use these elements. The first is that using these elements makes it easier for a reader to scan and assess what we've written and determine whether or not that's relevant to their wants and needs. Secondly, these elements provide an effective guidepost to frame our brand stories and our copywriting itself. We'll be covering all three of these points in this session. To introduce the concept of copywriting elements, let's look at the direct marketing piece on the screen. The ad has almost all of the elements you would expect any print advert to have. The only things not showing here is a logo and a response device which is something like a website URL, email address, telephone number, or one of those QR codes, you know, that square made of dots that takes you to a website via your mobile or your tablet. At any rate, of response devices. So, to recap on our 10 copywriting elements. The headline exists to get your attention. Remember, part of the reason I'm covering print advertisement is for you to learn the traditional rules of copywriting and then transferring this knowledge into the digital and online sphere. Understanding traditional print copywriting will make that process easier and seamless. So when I say headline, also think about press release titles, web page titles, blog post titles, email subject lines, sentences for your tweets, headlines for your Facebook posts, Instagram pics, Pinterest pins, YouTube video titles, you get the idea. These online formats are all forms of headlines, so the headline exists to grab someone's attention. That headline also draws that person to the subheadline. And to recap on that, 
A subheadline gives you more information and further explains the attention grabbing headline. A photo or drawing gets your attention and illustrates the product or the service more fully. A caption is that bit of text that appears usually beneath a photo or a drawing and is used to describe that photo or drawing. This is an important element and one that, that is actually often read. The copy itself conveys, conveys the main selling message for your product or service. Paragraph headings break up the copy into readable chunks, thereby making the overall copy look less imposing. A logo displays the name of the company or the service selling the product or service. Adding a price lets the reader know what the product or service actually costs. The price could be in large type, or you can bury it within the copy itself. The response device gives a reader a way to respond to your ad, either by using a coupon, toll-free number, or ordering information. And again, as I said before, it traditionally appears near the end of the ad. The overall layout of your copywriting piece provides the overall appearance for your ad. And it does it by using effective graphic design, incorporating all of the other elements. Again, this correlates to web page layout and blog posts layout. As I mentioned earlier, there is a singular purpose for all the elements in an ad, a purpose so important that it, con that it constitutes one of the essential concepts in Sugarman's approach to copy. When you first come across an ad like the one you see on the screen, you may have looked at the photo at the top of the page, or the other photos. You may have then read the headline, read the subheadline and then glance down to the name of the company selling the product. When you looked at the ad overall, you may have noticed the layout, the paragraph headings scattered about the layout, and the attractive graphic and typographical presentation. There are plenty of elements that can draw your attention before you start reading the copy. The most important thing is this. All the elements in an advertisement, web page, blog post, email, or whatever form you're writing, are primarily designed to do one thing and one thing only, to get a person to read the first sentence of the copy that you've written. I've spent years debating this with students. Yes, the purpose of a subheadline is designed to give a reader more information and to further explain the attention-grabbing grab headline. However, it's designed to get the reader to read the copy. The main purpose of the logo in an advertisement is to establish the corporate identity of the company selling the product or the service. However, its appearance in an ad is designed to get the reader to read the copy. Really. Honestly. If you have any doubt whatsoever about this, think about this. What is a Prada handbag's purpose. And then ask yourself what a Prada handbag is actually designed to do. What is a Jaguar's purpose? What is it designed to do? When you realize the difference between what the individual purpose, purposes are for each of these 10 copywriting elements, and then realize the singular thing that they're designed to do, and start writing with this knowledge in the back of your mind, You'll be amazed at the change in your copywriting results, whether your copy is in a print advert or whether you write for an online format. Trust me, I'm a copywriter. And here's an example of my own copywriting practice. This was a hybrid blog post slash mini article that I wrote that went viral at the time of its publication. And by viral, I mean it was read by just over 2,000 unique readers within the first two hours of its pu publication, and averaged around 6,000 unique readers per day for a couple of weeks afterwards. The traffic that this drove to the Aardvark website was phenomenal, as were the sales in the weeks that this blog post continued to be shared and commented upon online. Sales remained buoyant for a while, even after interest in this particular piece began to wane. No, it's not traditional sales copywriting, I'll hear you say. However, it is a brand story, a uniquely Aardvark brand story. And I'll get, it, get into this much later. 
and I'll specifically cover things like this in the blogging unit. Not all copy needs to be directly sales related or orientated. The topic of this blog post was something that needed to be said within the music industry. As a maverick within that industry, it made perfect sense for me to say it. It added not only to my credibility as an innovative and forward-thinking senior music executive, it went hand in glove with the tr transparency the Aardvark brand was already renowned for. It fit our unique selling point. Now with this preamble out of the way, look at the form and the function of the actual copy itself. Everything, each and every element that I use was crafted to get people to read that first sentence, and from there, the rest of the copy, which they did in droves. With the numbers who shared it and commented on it online, it clearly struck a nerve and resonated with people. Basically, the peak in sales that we had, that was just added value. That was pure gravy. It was the message that was important, the central branding message about Aardvark Records itself. That title appeared everywhere, by the way, online, in print publications, and cited during the press and media interviews that followed. And in one way, shape, or form, that first sentence was recycled as well, both online and offline, when this piece was being covered. Things like Aardvark's controversial CEO, music industry maverick, the, the enfant terrible of the music industry. These were all phrases used in print as introductory pieces for my press and media interviews. Copywriters refer to this type of writing as a thought piece. It's advanced stuff. It can, only, it can only successfully be done once you have successfully established a brand identity and credibility. I use it as an example to emphasize the point that every copywriting element is designed to get that first sentence read. If the purpose of all the elements in an ad is to get you to read the copy, then what I'm really talking about is reading the very first sentence. So what does that tell you about the first sentence? Well, that is pretty important. And if the first sentence is pretty important, what do you hope the person who looks at your copy actually does? Well, read it. If the reader doesn't read your very first sentence, chances are that he or she won't read your second sentence. So, what can you do to make the first sentence so compelling to read, so simple, so interesting, that your readers, every one of them, will read it in its entirety. The answer? Make it short. If you look at many of my first sentences, they're so short, they're almost, well, they're actually not really sentences. Some typical first sentences we see, just about everywhere, are things like, losing weight is not easy. It's you against a computer. It's easy. It had to happen. Each sentence is so short and so easy to read that your reader starts to read your copy almost as though they're being sucked into it. It's no accident that magazines use this exact technique. Many magazines use a variation of this technique in their articles. They start an article not with a very short sentence, but maybe with a very large type. Once they've sucked you into reading the copy, and you turn the page to read the rest of the article, you notice that the typeface has gotten smaller, but that's okay. The purpose of the large type was to actually get you into the, into the article, and it actually worked. Now it's up to the author to keep you reading and turning the pages. In any form of advertisement, you've got a lot going against you, unless the readers are genuinely interested in your product or your service. And if they are, then you've got to really grab and keep them. So your first sentence should be very compelling by virtue of its short length and ease of reading. No long multisyllabic words. Keep it short, sweet, and almost incomplete so that the reader has to read the next sentence. If all the elements are designed to get you to read that very first sentence of copy, then what's the purpose of the first sentence? If you guess that it's to convey a benefit or explain a feature, that would be impossible. How could a short first sentence do anything more than get you to read it? The correct answer is, of course, 
The purpose of the first sentence is to get you to read the second sentence. Nothing more, nothing less. You've probably figured this one out already. The sole purpose of the first sentence in an advertisement is to get you to read the second sentence. The reason why I'm an advocate to the Sugarman School of Copywriting is because it works, especially if you're new to copywriting. Like anything, once you learn the basics, like I did many years ago, it's easy to adapt the rules to your particular copywriting style, needs, and requirements. The Sugarman approach has proven to be a powerful and successful formula, and one that stood the test of time. Previous students I've taught this to have gone on to do great award-winning copywriting work. Now you should be starting to get a feel for this approach to copywriting. So if I were to ask you what the purpose of the second sentence is, and you answered to get you to read the third sentence, you'd be absolutely correct. And for those of you who didn't anticipate that last answer, and I asked you what the purpose of the third sentence was, you should be answering to get you to read the fourth sentence, and so on and so forth. And I think you've got it. Notice there was no mention of benefits, or product, or service description, or unique features. The only purpose of the first few sentences of your copy is to get people to read the sentences that follow. True, at some point we do have to start talking about product features or benefits. That comes in a bit. But if you lose sight of the fact that your sole purpose at the beginning of your copy is to hold that reader's attention at almost any cost, then you may lose your reader for lack of interest. In copywriting, as in selling, if your reader isn't riveted to every word you write in the first few sentences, then your chances of having that reader get to the real sales pitch are very, very remote. My copywriting follows this format with very few exceptions and typically achieves great results. So why don't we make that sales pitch at the beginning? This is certainly possible, of course, but then it's often more times than not, it's not very effective. I've tried putting the sales message at the beginning of an ad, I've tried using every trick in the book to prove Sugarman's theory wrong, and I've, I've personally failed at each and every attempt. Just remember that the sole purpose of all the elements of your copy is to get people to read that first sentence. Make that first sentence so easy to read that your reader is almost compelled to read it. You can grasp this, and I mean really, really grasp this you've got an awfully good start and a great understanding of copywriting and the persuasive process. One additional comment, always make those first few sentences about your reader. I'm gonna repeat that again because it's a really important point. Always make those first few sentences about your reader. It's not about you. Those initial sentences are from you, but they're aimed squarely for Notice I didn't say at. They are squarely aimed for your readers. They should be conversational in tone, almost like a, hey, did you hear about? Or wow, I just found out. Or have you heard of? Think about how you talk to your mates when you're out and about. You know, when you're speaking to people whose opinion really matters to you. This is one of the key secrets to writing persuasive copy. Besides holding the reader's attention, there's another important function we're trying to accomplish in the first paragraphs of our copy, and that's to create something called a buying environment. To explain what I mean about a buying environment, let me give you an example. A few years ago, more years than I actually really care to think about, I was invited to the MOBO Music Awards in London. It was a VIP pass type of deal, so hey, there was no real pressure there, not really. I hit the Moulton Street area in London and searched for a suit that would make an impression. I was representing my own company at the time, so again, branding was uppermost in my mind. Image counts for everything in the music business. I first went into Brown's, which, as a store for me, had always been a bit of a hit-or-miss affair. There'd never really been a consistency in terms of style or quality for me, and the staff usually put me off. They were either too aggressive or too dismissive. It was never a place I really enjoyed shopping in. For me, the sales environment was just off. And it was definitely off on this day. 
The sales staff looked bored. They were definitely non-responsive, and the music was far too loud. I was in and out inside of five minutes. Burberry and Ted Baker were just... How can I say? They were just too English for me. It takes a certain kind of guy to pull off Ted Baker and Burberry. Usually someone who's uber pale and uber thin, and I'm neither. So that was... Well, that was pretty much an, an, another less than five minutes type job. So there I am. I go sauntering into the Donna Karen store, you know, like you do. To cut a long story short, I found a strong contender for the suit. This suit was the business. The cut, the fabric and design just spoke to me. Pure jet black brocade. Just painting a picture for you. Suit jacket was done in the style of an 18th century gentleman's frock coat. For those of you who have an interest in fashion, the lines of this coat were simple and cleverly done. The detailing was intricate, but not in your face. All of the detailing was around the buttons, buttonholes, cuffs, pockets, late, no, lapel, collar, and it was all done in a style that I can only describe as that kind of henna decoration, but done in a contrasting black thread. It's the kind of subtle workmanship that can only be appreciated up close. The suit, complete with a vest, simple black trousers, and a kind of pure white linen Puritan shirt and cravat, was perfectly displayed. It was in, the, in an area, all on its own, with lighting worthy of a Gainsborough painting in the National Gallery. It also came with a price tag, 1500 quid, and this was back in the 90s. The suit itself was perfect. Not too much, not too little. As a signature suit, it was bang on the money for what I required. But it was 1,500 quid. It wasn't that I couldn't afford it. I was trying to justify spending that kind of money on a suit that I knew I would probably only ever wear once. Enter the store manager. She was a woman of a certain age and clearly in charge. I knew that she'd been assessing, assessing me and reading me as I looked at that suit from different angles and she'd been sussing me out while I was scrutinizing the craftsmanship. One of the younger salespeople started walking towards me but was stopped in their tracks by just a subtle hand gesture from the store manager. She gave me about eight minutes or so before casually walking over to me. She knew that the younger salespeople were going to blow it. They're going to wreck that perfect buying environment. She came up beside me, leant her head in, and just whispered, so, just whispered softly enough, that suit was made for you. The way she said it, it was almost conspiratorial, and I'll never forget her voice. It's what I call that Siggy and Scotch kind of voice, like Kathleen Turner or Lauren Bacall. This was very seductive, intelligent, and knowing kind of voice. It was like good old St. Nick had just jumped up on my left shoulder. I could see why she was the manager. She knew how to carry herself. She was polished to perfection. And I knew that she knew what my real dilemma was. All I could say to her was, I know. She didn't push. We spoke about the MOBA awards. We shared a mutual laugh about the outlandish outfits that would probably be on display. She got me to talking about my preferences for simple lines, simple cuts, but with attention to subtle detailing and classic looks with just a little something different about them. There was no hard sell. She knew she didn't have to. And I knew that she got me and knew where I was coming from. Her presence, the store itself, and our conversation about that suit created the perfect buying environment. So why didn't she push it? She knew that there was a 50-50 chance that I wouldn't buy the suit, and, if I didn't, that I would more than likely buy a different suit in her store. And she was right. No, nope. in the end, I didn't buy that suit. And believe it or not, I still kick myself for that decision to this day. But what I did do was go on to buy two less expensive suits that more or less equaled the same am amount of money as that one single suit that had initially caught my eye. Copywriting works in much the same way. Once you realize the importance of setting up a buying environment, you'll know that it must be done in the early stages of an advertisement. 
when you establish the reading momentum at the start of your copy, you also want to start establishing the buying environment as well. That Donna, that Donna Karen store had it to first get me into the store and then slowly draw me towards the area where that suit just put me in the ideal buying mood. There's no other better way of explaining it. That was down to the presentation of the store and its staff. If this all sounds hard to do in print, it really isn't. You'll be seeing plenty of examples of this later on. And I'll be showing you how to establish buying environments as you establish the momentum in your writing. For example, if I was selling products at a discount, I would use big type for my price and lots of busy graphic elements. In short, I would make the copy look like a typical discount ad. And conversely, if I was selling something really expensive, I would present myself in an environment that showed class and refinement, that exuded confidence and trust. And a lot of what's called negative space, that empty space that you see around words and images. As a copywriter, you control the environment. As a copywriter, no matter the copywriting form, you have control over the buying environment. The environment that you choose is created in both the graphic elements and the copy, but especially the copy, by the way you phrase your words, the choice of words, the level of integrity that you convey, and the tone of voice that you use in your copy. Unlike a store where you spend thousands of pounds to create an environment, you can do it all simply in your copy, or the look of your website, or your blog. The environment is critical in getting a prospective customer into a buying mood. And to create that environment, you attract your audience's attention with elements like a headline, photos, logos, etc. Then you've got to get the person to read that first sentence by making it so simple and so compelling that the reader can't help but read it. And the next sentence, and then the next. And while the reader is reading, you're creating an environment just as surely as that Donna Karen store was drawing me towards that area where that 1,500 pound suit was being displayed. So now we're ready for my fourth point. Your copy layout in the first paragraphs of your ad must create the buying environment most conducive to the, to the sale of your product or service. Creating the ideal buying environment comes from experience and the specific knowledge you get from studying your project and your audience. It comes from understanding the nature of your product or service. We've made great strides into the topic of unique selling points in the form of benefits, values, and elements that make your brand unique in the Intro to Branding unit. We'll be developing this further in this unit and the following units. But for now, realize how important creating the buyer, buying environment is to eventually selling your product or your service. To understand how we get the reader not only to read, but to feel comfortable and be in a buying mood within the environment that you've created. Okay, so the first thing you do in selling is to set up the buying environment. This means getting the attention of your audience. And that certainly makes sense and is related to the headline of your copy. Once you have the prospect's attention, the next step is to introduce yourself and say something that'll keep the attention of the prospect. This is similar to the subheadline in the photos and the captions. Then comes the sales pitch or the copy. During this activity, the seller should have two thoughts in mind. The first is that the buyer must like and develop confidence in the seller. The buyer must believe that the seller knows his or her product or service. Second, the seller must somehow relate the product to the buyer and the buyer's needs. That's pretty clear. But the buyer and the seller must vibrate together. There must be a harmony struck between the buyer and the seller or the persuasive brand sales message won't come through. There are many methods for creating this harmony, and two of the most important apply very directly to the online copywriting. 
It's about establishing resonance and relevance with the prospective reader. First, you have to get the prospective reader to start saying yes. Second, you've got to make statements that are both honest and believable. I'm going to use a classic example from Sugarman. A car salesman says, nice day, Mr. Jones. Mr. Jones then answers, yes. It is a nice day after all. The statement is truthful and the, con and the consumer answers in the affirmative. May I show you one of the latest models with improvements over the model that you currently own? Yes. The salesman once again says the obvious to get a yes answer, and the harmony continues. In short, you try to get a prospective audience member to nod his or her head in the affirmative and agree with you, or at least you make truthful statements that the prospect knows are correct and would concur with. Make sure that the prospect does not disagree with something that you're saying. If, for example, the salesman had said, could you use a new Buick, and the customer said no, the sale would have taken a bad turn straight away and the harmony would have been lost. In copywriting, the reader would have stopped reading and either turned the page to read another bit of copy or surfed off to another website. Harmony is the key. The moment you get the reader to say no, or even, I really don't believe what this guy is saying, or I don't think this relates to me, you've lost the reader. But as long as the reader keeps saying yes, or believes what you're saying is correct, and continues to stay interested, you're going to be harmonizing with the reader, eventually reaching the action point, or a call to action, the sales bit. So now we have three things that we're trying to do at the beginning of our copy. First, we want the reader to read the copy. Remember, that's the objective of all copy. Without the prospect reading the copy, you have nothing. Then, we create the type of environment through copy that causes the prospect to feel comfortable in exchanging his or her hard-earned money for your product or service. And finally, we want the prospect to harmonize with us, to agree with us, by feeling that indeed we are saying something that is truthful, interesting, and informative, and that the prospect can agree with. In short, we want agreement. We want that head to nod in the affirmative. We want that harmony. Get the reader to say yes and harmonize with your accurate and truthful statements while reading your copy. Your reader should be so compelled to read your copy that they can't stop reading until they read all of it. It's, it's, it's like sliding down what Sugarman refers to as the slippery slide. One way to increase readership is by applying a theory called Seeds of Curiosity. And it goes something like this. At the end of a paragraph, I'll often put a very short sentence that offers some reason for the reader to read the next paragraph. I use sentences such as, but there's more, or so read on, or even, but I didn't stop there, or let me explain. Another one would be, now here comes the good part. These seeds of curiosity cause you to subconsciously continue reading, even though you might be at a point in the copy where the copy actually slows down. This concept is used a lot in television before the show host goes to a commercial break. He or she might say something like, when we come back, we'll see something that you've never seen on TV before, so stay tuned. Well, we should do these kind of things in print too. And here's why. See, notice how I just used it? You'll see some more examples on the screen. In print, the ideal situation is to create such interesting and compelling copy that you don't need seeds of curiosity. But I'm going to be honest, that's a really difficult thing to pull off. And using these seeds of curiosity actually enhances most copy, but like every good thing, just don't overdo it. Seeds of curiosity can also be used at the beginning of copy when you mention some benefit or payoff that you're going to reveal somewhere in your copy. In short, the reader has to read the entire copy to find it. If you're dishonest, it's sensed by the reader. If you're hiding something about a product you're describing, believe me, this comes through loud and clear. If you're very creative, it too 
is also picked up. And it's the combination of all of these impressions that creates the buying environment. If you study the copy of others, you can sense what, they, what they're like from their copy. You'll be amazed at how the copy reflects the personality of the person writing it. And one of the most powerful techniques to keep your slippery slide greased is by using things like seeds of curiosity. Your readers must get into your copy. They must read your headline and be so compelled to read further that they read your subheadline. Then they must be so moved that they read your first sentence. And the rest of the copy must be so compelling that by the time your prospect reads 50% of your copy, they're helplessly caught in a slippery slide and can't escape. Once you start applying the slippery slide approach and the seeds of curiosity, you'll have two of the most powerful copywriting tools that you can use. Keep the copy interesting and the reader interested through the power of curiosity. There are five basic types of seed curiosity transitions that you can use. On the screen is, a, is an example of the first, adding clarification or driving home a point. The phrases on the screen are some classic examples of this writing device. For example, here's the thing, or, but here's the kicker, or even, here's my point, or one more, my point is this. Pause the video and take a minute to read through the example given on the screen to see this technique in action. The next technique is informing your reader that you're about to add clarity or proof to what you've just said. The phrases on the screen are some classic examples of this writing device. Please allow me to explain, or let me explain, or I'll explain, or even here's what I mean. Pause the video and take a minute to read through the examples given on the screen to see this technique in action. The next technique is asking people to take a minute and reflect on something. On the screen, you'll see some classic, classic examples of this particular device. Some examples are, take a minute to think about what that means, or imagine what that will mean to your life, or even think about the value of this. Another one would be, so what's the value here? Or one last one, let that rattle around your noggin for a minute. Again, pause the video, take a minute to read through the examples given on the screen to see this particular writing device in action. The fourth technique is reminding a reader of a benefit you mentioned previously. Again, on the screen, you'll see some classic, classic examples. Some I'll mention are, as I said before, or earlier I mentioned, Another one would be, as I mentioned previously, keep in mind, don't forget, remember. Again, take a minute to just pause the video and read through the examples. The last seed to curiosity technique is reminding or alerting your reader that there's more, and even better, news coming up. Again, on the screen, some classic examples. I'll highlight a few of them, but there's more. But it's even better than that. But that's not all. There's much more to tell you. Here's something else. One more thing. But here's the best news. Better still. Again, for one last time, pause the video and feel free to take a look and get familiar with some of the examples given on the screen. Okay, so we've covered some general principles of copywriting. You've learned that all the elements of an advertisement are designed to get prospects to read the first sentence. And we covered how to get prospective audience members to start reading your copy by creating a very simple first sentence. And then we covered how important it is to get the second sentence read, and then the third, and the fourth, and so on. I covered how we don't mention benefits or features of a product at the start of our copy, because the sole purpose of the copy was to first get people to read the copy, the benefits, those come later. And then we covered the environment you create at the beginning of your copy. We explain the importance of resonating with your reader 
by getting the reader to say yes, believe you, or agree with what you're saying. I express the importance of the reader slipping through your copy as if they were on a slippery slide, reading the copy so they can read the whole of your copy. And we've just covered how Seeds of Curiosity work to keep the slippery slide fully greased. Now we enter emotion in copywriting. Yes, emotion makes a return. We spent a lot of time covering emotion in the Intro to Branding unit, and here it is again. There are just three points to remember about the subject of emotion and copywriting. I'm going to call the first Emotion Principle 1. Every word has an emotion associated with it and tells a story. Emotion Principle 2. Every good bit of copy is an emotional outpouring of words, feelings, and impressions. And the last, emotional principle three, you sell on emotion, but you justify a purchase with logic. I'm going to repeat that one because it's important. You sell on emotion, but you justify a purchase in an audience member's head with logic. And if that last point's not quite making sense, just again, cast your mind back to that Donna Karen suit story that I outlined earlier. Let's take that last point first. Emotion principle three. You sell an emotion, but you justify a purchase with logic. Why do you think people buy the Mercedes-Benz automobile in the, in the US or the UK? Is it because of the rack and pinion steering, or the anti-locking braking system, or the safety features? Other cars have exactly the same features, so why spend a fortune to buy one when, for a fraction of the cost of a Mercedes, you can get an American or Japanese car, or even a Volvo, that has many of the same exact features? The answer is, we buy an emotion and justify it with logic. And again, remember my Donna Karen story. Logic sat on my right shoulder and emotion on my left, and both were constantly prodding me the entire time that I was in that buying environment. Now, some people will say that they buy a Mercedes due to a series of technical features that they find very impressive. The real reason they buy the car isn't for the technical features at all. They want to own a prestigious car and belong to the crowd that drives a Mercedes. And there's nothing wrong with that. It is what it is. Usually, when having to explain the reason for non-essential purchases, people end up using logic. Something that they probably really believed was correct when they actually made that purchase. Logic doesn't often work well in writing copy for an advertisement. Typically, we get our readers into an emotional frame of mind as a result of the environment we've created, and logic becomes less important. For example, how many times have we seen the phrase near the end of an ad that reads, if you aren't absolutely satisfied, return your product within 30 days for a prompt and courteous refund? Who ever heard of a refund being courteous? It doesn't matter. The emotion or the feel of that phrase really says that the company or service is a very respectful and understanding company that will return your money very promptly. With very few words, it conveys the feeling of being a concerned company that acts promptly. And it doesn't have to make any logical sense. Often, a phrase or sentence, or even a premise, doesn't have to be logically correct as long as it conveys the message emotionally. It not only does the job, but does it more effectively than just a simple logical message. One example I'll use from my own practice is a band signed to Aardvark by the name of Kalel. This Scottish four-piece contemporaries of One Direction in terms of looks, age, and marketplace, except for the fact that they're all Scottish and they'd all actually grown up together from childhood, and they weren't manufactured either. Um, they wrote, produced, and arranged their own music, and oh yeah, they actually played instruments. So, 
and going head to head with One Direction's multi million ma- multi million dollar international marketing juggernaut. How did I use emotion to differentiate Kalal from One Direction? With an ad featuring the tagline, the boy band CD you won't be embarrassed to leave on your coffee, ta- coffee table. The ad was a terrific success. Not only did it raise the band's profile with university age students, who weren't really our target audience, it raised the band's profile in sales with the 28 to 35 year old women who were the intended audience. Understanding the importance of that demographic, the ad also appealed to males in roughly the same age bracket due to proximity of the intended female audience and gay men who simply found the guys attractive um, and liked the quality of the band songs. All of that with a simple sentence that touched on people's emotions. But look at the emotional approach I used. There's nothing about the band's technical advantages and by that I mean there's not, you know, there's no mention of them writing their own songs, actually playing their own instruments, etc. I just knew the nature of the product and the person who I knew would be buying the product. I didn't even have to mention One Direction. I didn't even have to hint about who we were referring to. It wasn't necessary. In the context of the ad, people got it. Embarrassment is one mighty powerful emotion. I'll make one final point. When the press wrote about One Direction during this period that we were launching Kalel, they never wrote about that particular act's musicianship or songwriting ability. It was all about how cute the lads were and the silly things they got up to. With Kalel, respect was given for the musicianship and their ability to craft their own great songs. And kind of as an aside, it was almost like, and who, by the way, these lights are pretty easy on the eye too. One band skated by on good looks and general scamper. The other received kudos and accolades from the heavy hitters in the music industry as well as the music industry press and caused more than a few hearts to flutter in the process. Each product has an inherent nature and understanding that inherent nature will help you sell it. Your copy needs to reflect this specific knowledge. If you're new to copywriting, the chances are you're going to get all hung up on writing the perfect first draft. As I mentioned in the introductory session to this unit, don't get hung up on this. I'll let you in on a little secret. The perfect first draft is like the perfect first date. Appreciate it when it happens because it's very, very, very rare. Even for seasoned copywriters like me. It's what I do after the first draft that makes my copy successful. Copy doesn't truly come into fruition until after some heavy duty editing, but I'll be getting into that a bit in a bit. The reason why my first drafts are typically sketchy is because my first draft is simply an emotional outpouring of my thoughts on a product and how I feel it should be promoted. It's almost like a catharsis, a free release of my emotions. I don't sweat the typos, the spelling, or the bad grammar, or the changes in tenses. Keep this in mind when you're writing your own copy. It makes absolutely no difference what your first draft looks like. If you can get all of your ideas, feelings, and emotions about the subject out onto paper and work from there, you will have mastered a very important technique. The final point on the emotion of copy copy relates to words themselves. If you realize that each word has an emotion attached to it, almost like a short story unto itself, then you will also have a very good understanding of what emotion means in the copywriting process. Look at a dictionary or a thesaurus, not as a collection of words, but as a collection of short stories. Never underestimate the power of words is enormous. What emotions do you feel when I mention the following words? Milton Keynes, ripoff, consumer, Rapper, lawyer, socialist. Milton Keynes may have evoked a little laughter, or even a grimace, as a place you might not consider moving to unless you already live in Milton Keynes. And if you do live there, please accept my apologies. I'm sure Milton Keynes is a very nice city, but every country on the planet has a famous utilitarian city that everyone makes fun of. And come on, be honest, when I said Milton Keynes, 
you immediately thought of concrete cow sculptures, didn't you? And then what do words like consumer and ripoff make you feel? The word rapper may not only remind you of what a rapper does for a living, but may also bring to mind words like cool, bling, wealth, controversial, misogynist, gritty, telling it like it is, integrity. Think of all the feelings the word rapper conjure up, conjures up, not only from your experience, but from what you feel emotionally and from what you've read in the press and seen in the media. The word socialist sounds less sinister to me than communist, as it does to many Brits and Europeans. To many Americans, they mean much in the same and convey almost the same level of negativity. What thoughts come to mind with the word lawyer? Please, no heckling from the back. When you analyze these words and see how you can use them to create a message that has an emotional impact, then you have mastered an important lesson in writing copy. Again, with the Kalel advert, we debated the choice between referencing shame and referencing embarrassment. And the consensus was that embarrassment was actually the more positive of the two words, um, and even a more humorous choice between those two words, which is why it's the word we went with in the end. Sometimes changing a single word will increase responses in an ad. Some words are just conceptually stronger than similar words. Think about the difference between the words repair and fix. Of the two, the word fix is stronger. It has a stronger connotation, hence being more effective in copy. Don't feel that you have to have a total command of the emotional impact of words to be a great copywriter. It takes testing and common sense more than anything else. And knowing the emotional feel of words is like your general knowledge. It comes with time. It is enough for now that you realize the importance of the emotional values in each and every word. And as time goes on, you'll feel this influence play a bigger and bigger role in your successful copywriting. Never sell a product or service. Always sell a concept. And what do I mean by a concept? There are many words that mean the same thing. One day, for example, the hot buzzword in advertising might be positioning. A product is positioned or placed in such a way to appeal to the consumer. It's a topic we've covered in the Intro to Branding unit. Other terms commonly used are big idea or USP, unique selling point. Maybe even gimmick. Whatever it's called, it means basically the same thing. As Sugarman says, you sell the sizzle and not the steak. It's the concept and not the product. The only exception to this rule is when the product is so unique or so new that the product itself has become the concept. And for that, again, I refer to Dyson. Dyson's a very classic example of this. In the beginning, it was the actual Hoover that was the focus of the sales copy. But as Dyson claimed market share and became an established product in its own right, the emphasis shifted from introducing the product to the market to a more concept-based focus. We understood what a Dyson did and how it worked and how it was different. Now, each Dyson ad differentiates the features of a Dyson through a unique concept. For example, handheld Dysons and multi-floor Dysons. There's even a robotic Dyson in development. Concepts started selling Dysons. The product itself was no longer the concept. Sometimes the concept naturally comes from the product, and other times the concept has to be created. Sticking with Dyson, it's still a Hoover, and as consumers, we get that. We get that it sucks up all manner of things and makes our homes look great, tidy, and neat. There are a myriad of, st of sizes, styles, and colors to choose from to suit our living spaces and even our personalities. And with more than a little bit of a nod and a wink toward the movie Fight Club, we can buy the exact Dyson make and model that defines us. Now, Dyson technology is creating barges that sucks up plastic waste from our rivers. And Dyson ball technology for cars is hitting the headlines. Now, Dyson stands for technological innovation and good environmental citizenship. Quite simply, Dyson is now more than the sum of its parts. Put simply, 
Splice is just no longer in the Hoover business. It's in the technology and innovation business, and it's inviting us to actually be part of that. Dyson is selling the challenge against inefficiency and waste. It took what was a very staid product, a bog standard Hoover, and gave its entire promotion a more emotional appeal. Yes, Dyson ads still explain how its brand of Hoover's work and their features, but their ads always ends with an emotional value that are more significant than the actual product itself. Honestly, watch some of the latest ads on YouTube. It's really simple stuff, but executed with genius. Their ads have some of the most effective copy in the business. The ads may, you know, they may be just a bunch of simple words, but boy, how those words are put together and the emotion that each one of those words contains. If your advertising just sells the product, be careful. You need a concept. If you've come up with a unique concept, fantastic. You'll do much better. You should have left the intro to branding unit with more than a few ideas on that front already. And I'll admit, finding the concept is often not very easy. It takes all of the skills of a conceptual thinker to come up with the right idea and the right proposition. If you haven't, revisit your empathy map, brand value map, and your mind mapping exercises, and think about the core elements of your product and service as a part of your brand. As a recap, the first thing for you to do is to look at your product or service in every imaginable way, frontwards, backwards, sideways, upside down, inside out. Because somewhere, right there in the product itself, lies the drama that will sell it to the people who want it. There may be 10,000 ways to bring that inherent drama to the stage. And given a world in which Me Too products multiply, multiply like mayflies, the drama may seem that much harder to find. It is. But every good product has it, I swear. And you have to find it in order to be an effective copywriter. Each and every product and service has that unique selling proposition that makes it stand out from all the rest. We spent so much time in the first unit of this course covering just that. And it is indeed up to you as a copywriter to realize this fact and discover your own product or service's uniqueness. If you do, the simple positioning of a product or service and the development of a concept can be so powerful that it can make the difference between a huge success and a loser. What are some of the mental steps required to write copy in general? And how do you go about writing effective copy? Well, let's establish a few things that you've learned already in this unit, and then take everything a step further. As you recall, I referred to things like general knowledge, the knowledge you've picked up simply by living, and specific knowledge, the knowledge you acquired while studying the specific product or service you want to write copy about. Assume you're now an expert on a particular product and you're about ready to start writing. The first thing I would do is go over all the material you have already have on your product or service and give it a great deal of thought to what you've just read and studied. Do plenty of thinking about what you want to write. You may jot down some headlines and some of the copy points that you really want to bring out. You must list those points that best describe the nature of the product that you're selling. And you might like to list some of the strong reasons that your product would appeal to your customers. You should have this already from all of the work that you've already done in the branding unit. Put all of your thoughts down on paper, but keep in mind you haven't really started writing that copy yet. This is just a uh, preparation stage. Or don't put a thing on paper, just think through everything that you know about the challenge you have to solve through your copy. You might even visualize the end result of your work. Maybe it's imagining that a stack of email has hit your inbox showing orders, or increased visits to your website, or online comments about your product or service. Maybe it's a client patting you on the back for a job well done. If that's what it takes you to, for it to work for you, then go there. Once you've done all that, do something that may seem a bit strange to you at first. Stop. 
That's right, stop. Do something else. Forget about the project. Do something fun. A stroll in the park, a walk down the street, grab a surfboard, hit the garden or the gym, or do lunch with a good friend. Whatever you do, let it be a total diversion from what you're currently working on. And please don't even think about the copy project. Whether you realize it or not, you're actually working on the copy constantly, even though you've put it entirely out of your mind. Your subconscious mind is actually processing everything you've learned, all of that data that you've just accumulated in general, and all of that information in particular. And believe it or not, your mind is then taking all of that data and running it through everything you know about copywriting and communications, mentally preparing you for the first version of your ad copy. It is taking this information and working through the millions of permutations possible to come up with in order to come up with the best solution for your branding problem. And you're doing absolutely nothing about it. You're just out having a good time while your brain is working like crazy in the background. And ironically, if you start thinking about your project again, you interrupt this process and the results won't be as good. This entire subconscious activity is called the incubation process. And the time that you're giving to it is called the incubation period. Your subconscious is processing millions of bits of data like a computer in your brain running a very important program in the background. Then, while you're taking a walk or standing in a shower or even daydreaming, suddenly that big idea will flash across your mind. It's like your eureka moment. That's when you go to your desk and you start writing down some of that good stuff your subconscious mind has just created and organized for you. Trust me. Some of my most genius ideas hit me while I was straddling a surfboard waiting for the next set of waves to roll in. Okay, sure, I know that there's some overambitious types out there who think that you can just skip the incubation period. And sure, you might think you can actually eliminate the incubation period. You never can. Even when the pressure of deadlines prevents me from taking the full luxury of time to incubate, I'm still incubating, but at a much more rapid speed. The results may not be as good, however. The time pressure only increases the incubation process and speeds up that kind of assimilation of data in my brain. If you have the luxury, your copywriting and what you produce will be far, better, far more improved if you balance the pressure of deadlines with time away from the project. This could also mean working on one project, then going to another, and subsequently coming back to the first one. This is another way of allowing you the luxury of having your subconscious mind work on a project while you're doing something else. The incubation process actually works best with pressure of some kind, I have to admit that. If you have no pressure, your brain will not, it just won't work as fast or as efficiently. So it's a balance of various pressures that produces the optimum results. So what causes pressure? Well, we already know that time causes pressure. But there are other factors as well. Ego, for example. If you have a big ego, it creates a certain amount of pressure. The pressure can be very positive in the incubation process. For example, a client expects you to produce some knockout copy and your ego won't, won't let you disappoint him or her. You've added to the incubation pressure. Your creative orientation plays a role too. For example, if you're, if you're naturally creative, you have a big advantage over someone who isn't. And finally, the environment plays a role. If you're in a creative environment that encourages those incubation activities required in the creative process, it will help the incubation process along. When it comes time to sit down and knock out that copy, discipline comes into play. You've got to let the copy come pouring out of your brain forgetting about spelling and grammar. Remember, your mind takes the data that you've accumulated and runs it through everything you know about copywriting, communication, and life in general. Well, hold back the, hold back the stuff on spelling and grammar just long enough to let the, co the copy actually flow out of you freely. 
it's kind of the whole left brain versus right brain stuff. <clears throat> if you're knowledgeable about writing and creative thinking, you know that there's been much said about the different hemispheres of our brains controlling different types of thinking. The right brain does the intuitive or emotional thinking, and the left brain does all the logical stuff. So which side of the brain should write the copy? Well, the right brain, of course. Let the copy flow out of that right brain hemisphere and let it pour out unencumbered by any left brain restraints. The pouring out of that copy or idea is the culmination of the incubation process. It's the end result of all that mental activity that's been running around in your head in the background while you're doing something else. Remember this. The incubation process is the power of your subconscious mind to use all of your knowledge and experiences to solve a specific problem. And its efficiency is dictated by time, creative orientation, environment, and ego. So this brings the first half of this lecture for this session to a close. I've hit you with rather a lot in this kind of initial lecture for this session. So take some time out, review your notes, and when you're ready, we'll pick up with the second half of this lecture.